And now, a Daystar special presentation. Welcome to this Daystar special presentation. Today, enjoy a time of worship, prayer, and a word from the Lord at this year's America for Jesus. During this program, call the number on your screen if you need prayer. Or submit your request anytime at daystar.com. Now get ready for a thought-provoking message from Ron Luce. This is the Daystar special presentation. America for Jesus and begin to contemplate what God would have us do here on the mall at the spiritual headwaters of our nation, we ask what are the very home sins, what are the root causes for what is going on in this nation? And for the next couple of hours, you're going to be participating as we go to these root sins. We're going to ask you during this time to ask yourself, do I need personal cleansing in this area? If you're like me, you're probably going to say, yes, I do. And as you are cleansed personally, then you're going to stand strong for God and ask God to cleanse our nation. Lord Jesus, we have harbored envy and selfish ambitions in our hearts, and God, we ask that you would forgive us, Lord Jesus, and start with me, each of us, Lord Jesus. We think of those people that we have envied and that we have wanted what they wanted. We have longed for theirs, and we have not been willing to be content with what you give us. Father, we pray that the healing will begin with us. Lord, we would embrace the wisdom that comes from heaven. Let us, first of all, be pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. And resist, Lord, the temptation to envy others and to put ourselves before them. In Jesus' precious name.
Lord, we present ourselves to you now, body, soul, and spirit. We're asking you to heal our land today. We're asking you to heal us. We're asking you to heal us in our bodies from the five senses that dominate us and cause us such overload that we are gluttonous in every area. We ask you today as we yield our soul to you, the mind, the will, and the emotions, and the very things where there is a bent and an addictive behavior pattern, would you heal the church today? Would you deliver people on these grounds today in the name of Jesus from the proclivity, the open door to this kind of behavior? Heal us. Heal the bent within us. And in our spiritual dimension today, would you restore to us the power of a right, disciplined, sound spirit. Spirit, soul, body. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, we call upon you, my Father. We ask for the Spirit of God to come now like never before to break us all down, to bring us into this place of humility, to destroy the violence that's in the inner city, to destroy all the work of the devil and darkness. And Lord, may this be the time, may these be the ones, and may the inner cities now crescendo with the fire of God. Let it be so. And all the people said, Jesus, begin to strengthen us, encourage us to fight against laziness, to fight against slothfulness, that we would stand up and give you glory, Jesus, that you deserve. I pray boldness, God, upon your people. I pray honor upon your people, strength upon your church. Raise up your church, God, to be strong in this land, God, and we'll give you all the glory all the honor and it's in jesus name i pray amen
you. And it's like Elijah going up to Mount Carmel. And we're saying, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Hallelujah. And there's only one way to come up this mountain. It's with clean hands and a pure heart. And we're here and we say, as Elijah said, Lord, let it be known this day we did it all at your word. We're here, Philadelphia. We're here, America, for Jesus. Woo! Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to introduce you, my co-chairman, Reverend Billy Wilson. All right. If you love Jesus tonight, let me hear the loudest amen you have. Amen. Wow. I believe there is a new generation rising in America that will take no and say we will not accept no for an answer. We are going to see awakening and revival in America in the 21st century. And here at America for Jesus, we are declaring that Jesus is Lord over America. And we are still one nation under the living God. If you agree, give him praise. Amen. We're very excited tonight to have the person that has choreographed and put together this evening that will be ministering in just a little while. A gentleman who preaches to more teenagers in America every year than any other person. Hundreds of thousands of American teenagers have heard his voice in ministry. God's hand remains upon him. I want you tonight to thank God for the director and the founder of Teen Mania and Acquire the Fire, Ron Luce. Come on, Ron. What's up, you guys? You know, when the older generation believes in the younger generation, you've got great shoulders to stand on. Now, I got to tell you something that makes me mad, though. You know, I don't know what makes me mad. What makes me mad is when people think that you guys, just because you're young, you can't be serious about God. They think you've got to be entertained to death, that you've got to be begged to come to church and begged to read your Bible. But I tell you, I see young people that are serious about God. We don't need pizza to come down to the altar. We need God at the altar. We don't need just another outing, just another thing to have fun. We need an encounter with God that revolutionizes the inside of our life. And that is what we're asking God for tonight and for this weekend, that your generation would encounter God. Could, could you agree with that? Could you pray for that tonight? In fact, you know, there are potentially millions of people watching right now all around the world. Could you just grab hands and we're going to start this, this whole event praying for your generation and then we're going to go for it. We're going to sing. We're going to shout. We're going to have a lot of fun. Father, right now, we just thank you. And we join together here in Philadelphia praying for the some 33 million teenagers all across the land, for the 2 billion teenagers all around the world. And God, we pray that you would pour yourself out, that you would make yourself known, that you would show yourself strong to a young generation, God. Grab a hold of their heart, God. Even tonight as they're watching, as they're listening to music, soften hearts, Lord, as they're clicking through channels, Lord. Get them to stop on God TV, Lord, and hear the whisper of heaven. God, we pray that you would pour yourself out on the young generation here in Philadelphia, here in America, and around the world. And everybody who agrees shouted, amen.
Would you do something with me right now? Let's just say the name of Jesus. 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 I believe with all of my heart. Yeah. Come on. I believe with all of my heart that God is going to do something so powerful and so profound in our midst tonight that if we truly understood it, if we truly comprehended it with our mind, it would probably just mess us up, you know? I had such an overwhelming sense as I walked backstage. They just asked me to share for a few moments to a generation. My name is Fateen. I just had such an overwhelming sense that God is going to mark a generation tonight. This isn't a warm up tonight, you guys. This isn't some kind of add on tonight. Tonight, God is going to set you apart to be a part of a hinged generation that will turn America back to God. I want to say that again. Tonight is a divine appointment with heaven. If you are on this field tonight, it's because before you were born, heaven called you by name. Heaven anointed you for a moment and for an hour. And I have this sense, you know, the Bible talks about how there is a great cloud of witnesses. There are generations that have gone before us in America that have stood for Christ, that were so in love with Jesus that they spilled out into the streets of their cities in the power of prayer, in the power of worship, in the power of the cross, and made a mark in their time. And God is about to do something in our midst tonight that I believe if we will posture ourselves before him to say, God, no matter how big it is, no matter how much it's going to take, God, we want everything that you have as a generation. Jesus, bring it on. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on. So before I, I share anything else, I just sense the hunger. You are here tonight because you want to be a part of making history for a generation. I can feel it. I can sense it. You know it in your belly and you know it in your gut and your knower. So let's just together with one heart, let's put our hands on our hearts right now and let's just give it to Jesus. Come on. Jesus, we're here, God, because we love you. We're not here to be entertained tonight, God. We're not here for a show. Lord, we are here to encounter you. And Jesus, we just ask, we just give you permission right now to begin to invade our heart. And God, let it even be a picture of what you are about to do in invading the heart of, the, of a generation and an entire nation, God. Father, would you begin with us? God, would you begin with us? Just say that in your heart tonight to him. Jesus, begin with me. Jesus, begin with me. Begin with me. Here I am tonight. If you're looking for a landing pad, Jesus, if you're looking for a humble little donkey to ride into a city on tonight, if you're looking for a humble little expression, we say, God, we don't have much, but we have our yes. And we say, yes, Jesus. We say, yes. We say, yes. We are here in Philadelphia. I'm Canadian. I'm sorry, I gotta let that out of the bag right off the bat. But I am here because there is such a jealousy in my heart for what God wants to do in this next emerging generation in America. Because I believe that the extent to which God moves in on your generation here in America, I believe this is a lead domino moment where God wants to tip something in the spirit to launch an awakening, a revival in the youth of America. 
that will touch the nations of the earth, that will touch my nation, that will touch Europe, that will touch South America and the nations of the earth. And I want to say again, tonight, with everything in my heart, I believe that God is saying that I want to mark you. I want to mark a generation. As I sought the Lord and just said, you know, God, like, what's the scripture? What do you want me to share right at the beginning here? I couldn't get out of my spirit a psalm. It's Psalm 24. Awesome psalm. And it says this. <laughs> some of you guys got some grass under your feet. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and those who dwell in it. And then it goes on to talk about who may ascend this hill, who may stand on his holy mountain. This generation, this is Jacob. I'm summarizing the Psalm right now. It says, this is Jacob, a generation who will seek his face. A generation, we are gathered here tonight to be marked as a generation who will seek his face. And I want to close with this, because this is how the psalm closes. And join with me, it says this. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. We speak to the heavenlies over Philadelphia right now, and we say, let the King of glory come in. Jesus! Jesus! Shout his name one more time. Jesus! Jesus, America is yours. And for some of you, this is a new thought. But I want you to leave this place this weekend and understand that God has set you as watchmen on the walls to be those who stand for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his ancient covenant people, the Jews. Tonight, we're going to unite in this way. Bishop Ann Jimenez, who is an awesome friend of Jerusalem and the Jewish people, she's gathered us together. What I want us to do is this. She's going to hold this microphone, because this microphone is a shofar. And we're going to do this. I want you to turn, and I want you to face this direction, because they tell me this is east. And we're going to look towards Jerusalem. And I want you to stretch your hands out toward Jerusalem. One day, many of you will stand in Jerusalem. You will go to Jerusalem. You will travel to Israel. And I'm going to blow this shofar three times. And at the third blast, I want you not just to hear the shofar. I want you to become the shofar. At the third blast, I want you to lift your voice and shout to the Lord on behalf of Jerusalem.
Listen, I just want to share a few things on my heart with you tonight. As uh, they mentioned, my name is Ron. Everybody say, hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. And uh, I love hanging out with young people. I've been doing it ever since I was young, and that's a long time ago, but I love hanging out with young people. I've got three kids of my own. And uh, can I just tell you that, you know, we've got a lot of things that are painted with the stripe called Christianity that don't look very much like Christ. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a part of that thing, right? I want to be a part of whatever, however we can reflect what Jesus looks like in this earth. What about you? You know, and I'm seeing more and more young people representing that, both here in America and around the world. That It's not about nationality. It's about if you love Jesus, you're in another nation. You're of another kingdom. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I notice is I'm trying to talk to young people about God. How many have ever tried to share your faith with somebody? You tried to tell them about Jesus. And even a lot of people inside the church, they don't, they don't really understand this book called the Bible. They don't know much about it. They don't know much about kind of the big picture of like this whole thing, God and Jesus and what, what's going on with this whole thing. In fact, I think a lot of people sort of feel like they showed up to a movie halfway through and they're trying to figure out the story. How many know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever done that? And you're like, wait a minute, did that? And then it ends and you go... What? Why is everybody crying? You know? <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? And, uh, you know, the story that kind of unfolds from the beginning of time. Why did God make this place? And what part do I have play, to play in that? It's sort of like, you ever gone to the mall and you're trying to look for a story? You can see that map on the side. And um, you're trying to find out where, where the story is you want. And there's that one red mark that says, you are here. And you're like, oh, okay, I hope you're not like that person that says, how do they know? Uh, (laughs) But if we just had a map like that where we could see, like, what happened before us and what's supposed to happen after and where are we? Something that said, you are here, and and, and it so happens we actually have a map like that. I have a copy of it in my hand right here. Um, And uh, and the the story that unfolds, isn't it interesting that that, uh, we as humans, we love stories, we we're, we movies and, and, and novels. It seems like we've always loved stories. We love, you know, a, a TV series where we even make our own stories. As we're, if you're a gamer, you get to be a part of the story and all that. And what, what about the story that unfolded from the very beginning, the story of God, the story of the beginning, the, the humanity? You know, it seems like all stories sort of start the same way. Something was once good, and then something awful happened, and tragedy happened, and then just at the right point, a hero came along and rescued the day, and uh, things were a lot better, and they all lived happily ever after. And if we were to try just to peer back into history, to look at the story, how this all began, you look at the very first book of the Bible called Genesis, the story of how the human story began, and you'll see these words that God said. Maybe you remember these words. They're written here. And at, at the very beginning of, 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 of all time here, as we know it, in, on the earth, God said these few words. He said, let there be light. And when he said those words, he flung planets and stars into orbit. Things began to explode in the galaxies. We began, if you were there, you would have seen something amazing unfold. I'm telling you, you would have seen stars after galaxies after galaxies continue to unfold. In fact, scientists say today they're still being made. He said, let there be light, and there's still light being made. Galaxies still, billions upon billions of galaxies. They've lost count. They can't even count them all. This is the power of our God. And then he makes this world, this place for us to live. What an amazing landscape he made, the thundering oceans the majestic mountains. I mean, streams and rivers and green. I mean, just imagine if you were there the day that all creation unfolded and you you saw it right before your eyes. God, the master artist, just rolling it all out. And then he made animals. What kind of a creative imagination does this God have of ours? 
I'm talking about the, uh, the big ones and the small ones, the funny ones every time. Why do you think people keep going back to zoos again and again every time you go? You're thinking, look at that little ear, look at that long nose. The funny things, the cuddly ones, the fierce ones. We look at them all and we go, it's all a reflection of the creative heart of God. And then in the middle of all this beauty, he makes a man and a woman. And in the middle of this amazing garden, he gives it to Adam and Eve, and he says, I want to walk with you. And, and I want you to be in charge of the garden. Have a great time. Name the animals. Have a great life. And so he starts the story of the human story with a purpose and a passion. And he, and he made us a little bit in his image because the story's about love. He says, I want to make a whole species of people that that I love to love and that they will love me back. And the thing about love is this, love cannot be forced. God wants us to love him, but he can't force us to love him. You know, and neither can you. You can't force somebody to love you. You might want to force somebody if you could, you know. <laughs> no, she's going to love me. I can watch that. She will. But we all know that love can't be forced in the, in the story where love is the center of the story. Love has to be chosen freely. And so... We see this story, Adam and Eve in the garden, right in the center with an amazing set of surroundings. And God says, be fruitful and multiply. Now, you know, that's got to be a good God. You know, you got to be thinking, if you're Adam, you're thinking, okay, could it get any better than this? He gives me a woman with no clothes on. And he says, be fruitful and multiply. If you don't love God for any other reason, you ought to love him for that, right? I mean, he set this whole thing up and made something beautiful in the context of marriage, right? A God who thinks of sex. Now, that's a good God right there. Look at somebody say, that's a good God right there. He thought it up. Hollywood didn't think it up. The porn industry didn't think it up. God thought it up. He must be a good God. I don't know if you can imagine being there the day they thought it up. They had a committee meeting, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're thinking, about, well, we're going to put the world together. We're going to have people. How are we going to get more of them? One of them looks at the other. You thinking what I'm thinking. <laughs> Got a little sparkle in there. I know. Are you serious? They start high-fiving each other. Those humans are going to have such a great life. They're so excited. They made us to live in this thing called love. But the problem is, you probably remember the story. Not very far into the story, just a couple chapters later, they find themselves in this garden of Eden, and there's a serpent there. And he starts taunting them and tempting them just the same way he taunts us and tempts us today. Did God really say, why don't you eat this? Why don't you just try this? Why I don't know if you've ever tried to imagine if you have been there in the garden of Eden the day that they got tempted. Just try to imagine what it may have looked like. There they were standing with this serpent trying to uh, figure out. Adam's with his wife. And the, the evil one says, did God really say? And she gets confused. And she takes the bite. And then he gives it, she gives it to her husband. My father... If there is no other way than this, drinking this cup to the dregs, I am ready. Do it your way. Before the rooster starts, you will deny me. So we know there was another garden. There was another garden.
so we start in one garden and we end in another. What started in a beautiful way and ended in tragedy as Adam and Eve ate the apple and they chose not to follow. And in that moment, as they chose to eat that apple, it wasn't just, oh, we did something bad. What happened in that moment is sin and darkness entered their heart. God had said, if you eat it, you're going to die. And their heart died. And when they died, it, they were separated from God. And the, and the point is this, is that every war, every starving child, every person who's ever been abused, anyone who's ever been abandoned, any war that's ever been fought, it all started that moment in the garden because darkness, darkness and death entered the heart of mankind. So we have a whole race of people that are dead. They're alive on the outside, but they're dead on the inside. And they try to distract themselves from their deadness, sometimes by entertainment, sometimes by gaming. Sometimes I'll just find a guy and a girl to try to take it, my mind off it. Most entertainment is just a distraction from our deadness. We're trying to pretend that we're not dead. People walking around like zombies, dead on the inside, but alive on the outside, with a fake smile, with a drink or a drug, self-medication. I don't want to reckon with the fact that my heart is dead and it all happened in that garden. It's like a domino effect from that day till this. Every generation of mankind, dead, 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 born dead. That's why Jesus said we needed to be born again. You're alive on the outside, but you're not alive on the inside. Jesus is saying you've got to be born again. And it's like this. Maybe you've had this happen. You, you, you get an email or you, you get a message on your computer and says, hey, open this up. You've got a free whatever. And then the very next email says, no, don't open it. It's got a virus. And too late, you already clicked. Bam, erased your whole thing, wrecked your whole hard drive. That's what happened to us. We got the virus, the virus called sin. Thank you very much, Adam and Eve. We all got it. And it, it was in us when we were born. And the problem is we all clicked on it. We clicked, we thought it was gonna be great. It clicked, oh, messed me up. Jacked up my whole hard drive. Jacked up my mind, my heart, my life, born in sin. And so here we have, God created this world with an amazing plan. He wants to walk with us and people got dead right away. And the problem is Jesus said it this way, they loved their darkness. So Jesus comes and he enters the scene and the story unfolds. He enters under the cover of night to rescue people who don't know they need to be rescued, to rescue people who don't want to be rescued because they love the thing that's killing them. They love the thing that's messing them up. So he comes under the darkness of night and every once in a while, he, you know, he comes in a very unsuspecting way in a barn. Like who would have thought a king would come in a barn, right? And, but he starts teaching and he starts alluding to himself. He goes, you know, you know that shepherd that had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered off and went to get that one? That's me. That's me. I came, you know? And he said these words that sometimes we, we don't understand or take out of context. He says things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Remember that? And I think sometimes we've used that as Christians. Sometimes we've used that and said, don't you know he's the way? You better. You better get close. He said he's the only way. I don't think he meant it like that. I think he's saying it like this. I think he meant it like this. There's no one else coming for you. I'm the way, I'm the only one. I'm the one that came on the rescue mission. I'm the one, I came for you. So then we see this glimpse of this other garden. We find Jesus in the closing moments, the closing hours of his life. And he's being torn. He's come with this whole message and now even his disciples are confused. We thought he was gonna, how could that? And now he's in the garden and he's praying these words. Remember? He says, Father, if there's any other way to rescue these people, I mean, I know you really want them, but if there's a plan B, could you bring it on now? But not my will, but yours be done. And then he goes back, but Lord, if there's any other way, bring it on now, but not my will, but yours be done. And he's kind of, he's being torn till he finally says, okay, I'm in. 
And some have called it the glorious surrender, where he surrenders even his own life. Laid down his life. He gave up his will, not my will. Let me hear you say, not my will. Not my will. He said, not what I want, but what you want. And he surrendered. And we saw just a moment ago how it unfolded in a tragic way. And we've seen that unfold before, trying to imagine what it would look like if we were there when Jesus gave his life. And even at that cross that day, after he passed away, there's this holy hush. Even the guard said, surely he was the son of God. And when we look at the cross, we kind of have that. <gasps> we know it's so important. We're not sure of all the implications. The center of all time was that moment when Jesus gave his life. But the good news is, is that three days later, something happened. The devil thought he had won. That stone rolled away. Just about when he was having a, a party in front of that stone, his party got interrupted. Death couldn't kill him because he did not participate in death. Death couldn't keep him down. Now, I don't know if you have ever really thought about if you were there that day and saw what happened. You know, it's interesting that God chose to roll the stone away. Jesus walked through walls later. We know that he didn't need the stone to be away. He could have walked through the stone, right? I think he just wanted everybody to peek in to make sure he wasn't there. And, and then, isn't it interesting you saw in the video there that they looked in and it says that his clothes were folded there. That's for the mothers out there who's ever told you to clean your room. If the Son of God can clean his room after he rises from the dead, surely you can clean your room. You know what I'm saying. And tonight I want you to consider this. What do you do? How do you respond? If you're here in Philadelphia or if you're somewhere around the world, how do you respond to a guy like that? How do you respond to a story like that? Came on a rescue mission when nobody wanted him to come. What do you, what do, you do to, in response to a guy who gives his whole life? You know, when you, when you hear the words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, when Jesus said those, now you understand why he would say, listen, if you really understand the real story behind the story, there's no possible response you could have except with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of, it's the only way to respond to such a great story, to such a great rescue. Because see, he didn't just rescue you from, oh, I did some bad things. He rescued you from this dead heart called sin. From, he rescued you from the craving for even wanting that thing. And I remember when it happened to me, I was 16 years old and I was just a, a party animal and Parents were divorced when I was a kid. I ran away from home. I'm a party animal, gone to dead churches my whole life. And I finally ran into some people that really knew Jesus. And I remember the moment I go, I have life. Because when he comes and lives inside you, he really gives you life. And he takes your deadness. This is the point. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And now tonight, for the next few moments, I want you to listen carefully to the words of the song. Because there's some of you tonight that you kind of believe in Jesus. You've been in church, maybe you even prayed a prayer. But you're living like a slave. You're living in chains. And you can't figure out why. But I go to church and all this kind of stuff. Listen, there's a lot of people that give lip service to this thing. But when you hear this message and you, you understand what he requires all of us. In fact, what, how do we respond? The only response he's worthy of is doing what he showed us to do in the garden. You know, not my will, but yours. He said, 
not what I want, not the cravings I want. I give myself to you. And I think what happens, we go, well, Lord, I want to pray and get out of hell. I don't want to go to hell forever, but I really don't want to give my will to you. And we live in chains. We go to church and we sing rah-rah Jesus songs. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we live like we're in chains because we haven't given them our will. We're still basically in charge. We just prayed a prayer and we want to be forgiven. Tonight, would you consider if you're one of these people? He wants our heart, but he wants our life, our will. It's kind of like the, um, it's kind of like the uh, horse, the wild horses on the prairie. And every night, the cowboys round them up because they're afraid that they're going to get eaten by the wolves and the wild animals. So they go out with guns and they scare them into the corral. And the wild stallions are like, leave me, I, I don't want to be in here. They don't realize it's for their own protection. And the next morning they are let out again, but then the cowboys round them up again. That's what a lot of young people are like every Sunday morning. Go to church, I really don't want to be here, but you forced me to go and okay, I'll go. And they're like these wild bucking broncos. And people go to church every week, but really their will is like that wild stallion, just like this, and God's going, listen, would you just come here and let me put my bridle in your mouth and, and let me harness all of your energy. I, he doesn't want to steal your energy. He wants to harness it so all of your energy and your power is thrust towards him. We're him in control of our life. That's when we submit our will to him. Not my will, but yours be done. Tonight, maybe you're wondering why. Why do my life, keep, it keeps breaking, keeps messing up. Maybe you're that bucking bronco and you, you, you know, your pastor, youth pastor forces you, come on to church, come on, go to youth, come on. You're like, okay, but I'm not gonna like it. Glorious surrender. When we put God's Holy Spirit, the bit of his Holy Spirit in our mouth and we submit to his will, freedom comes. Would you just close your eyes with me for just a moment tonight? And I want you to look inside for just a second for any signs of deadness. If you're going to be totally honest tonight, you say, Ron, I've, I can see some signs of deadness in me. I've been kind of sort of that person alive on the outside, but dead on the inside, but I don't want to stay that way. I want to pray with you tonight if that's you. Those of you at home, it's time to surrender to God. You felt like you've been dead on the inside. It's time for real life to come. If your hand's raised, would you just pray with me? And if you're home, you can pray with us. Just cry out to him. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight, I surrender to you. I ask you to pour your life into me. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my will to you. I surrender my heart to you. And I ask for your kingdom to come and your will, what you want to be done inside of me. Breathe your life into me and forgive me, Lord. I believe you died on the cross for me, Jesus. And I believe you rose from the dead. Now come and live inside me tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now just tell them tonight, I surrender to you. I surrender to you. Now can we just sing these words together? My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has risen me. And like a flood, His mercy Ending love, amazing grace. We hope you've enjoyed this Daystar special presentation. Partners like you make it possible for Daystar to air events like this one from America for Jesus around the world. Please continue to call our toll free number if you'd like prayer or submit your requests at daystar.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest happenings on Daystar. Thank you for joining us. God bless. Thank you for joining us for this Daystar special presentation. If you would like to receive prayer or find out more about this broadcast, call or log on. You can also watch many of these broadcasts in full with Daystar VOD online at daystar.com.